Hi, welcome everyone, and thank you for choosing to attend this lecture on engagement in debating, organized by Debate Association Singapore. Just a little bit about me before we begin. My name is Fiha, and I'm a full-time debate and public speaking coach. I currently coach St. Gabriel's Secondary School, ACS International, the SGI International Junior Team, as well as the competitive varsity team at NTU. I have been successfully competitively debating for almost 10 years now and was even unsuccessfully active at it for quite a while before that. So I promise I have a broad spectrum of experience to understand exactly how you might feel about learning the intricacies of how to debate. For those of you who attended Farhan's lecture yesterday, you would have learned how to win by prepping a strong case for yourself. If not, the video for that is going to be available on the DA Outreach YouTube channel, and you can go check it out later once it is available. This lecture is sort of the part two to that one because we are going to focus specifically on how to win a debate through engaging and taking down the other side's prepped case. So, the agenda for today is as follows. We're going to look at the steps to take for a basic rebuttal, followed by how to prove the significance of those rebuttals. We are then going to cover some basic strategies to employ when choosing what to rebut, and we'll follow that by looking at basic argument fallacies, talk through how to use POIs strategically, and then finally go through some effective note-taking strategies. Note that none of the things that I'm going to talk to you about today are exhaustive in possibilities. We're merely going to walk through some of the possible strategies that you need to know about engagement and some easy steps you can follow for the next time you find yourself in a debate, whether in a competition or even in the comment section of a controversial social media post. Feel free to type any of your questions in the chat box and I will answer as many as I can at the end of the lecture because there is a lot of content that I'm about to basically throw at you throughout this lecture. So, let's start with the basic steps to rebuttal. In essence, rebuttals are about proving the other side wrong. However, it is not good enough to simply claim that something is wrong, you have to actually disprove the premise itself. This is true both in debating and out of it in any day-to-day -day civil discourse. So let me show you what I mean. There are two basic steps to any rebuttal. First, you have your not true response. You have to prove why the statement made is false and you can choose to do that either through providing statistics, analogies, examples, or a characterization of the situation. This bit should be fairly intuitively easy for most people. Basically, identify something factually untrue and call it out with evidence. The second step is the slightly more complicated step. It is known as the even-if response. The aim of an even-if response is to relate with the other side and then use their own context or premise to prove them wrong. There are three possibilities of even ifs that you can run. You could either prove that even if the premises are true, the outcome that they claim won't happen, or you could prove that even if the outcome does happen, that the outcome is bad or undesirable, or lastly, you could prove that even if the outcome is good, it is not as good as the outcome that your team has. So to give you some sort of analogy for what this looks like, all arguments, both in and out of debating, generally come in the format of X is true, therefore Y and Z. Rebutting is all about first proving that X is not true. Following that by saying, well, even if X is true, Y and Z won't happen. Then following that up by saying, 
Well, even if Y and Z do happen, they are bad and we should not want them to happen at all. And lastly, you can end with saying, even if Y and Z actually are good, they are not as good as, let's say, A, B, C from our team. Of course, reasonably, it is probably impossible to feasibly conjure up all of these responses within the span of a single speech during a debate competition. So the effective one to go for always is to start with saying the not true response and then choosing any one of these three even if strategies that you think you can argue for best. Obviously, the best case scenario would be that you are able to do one not true layer and three even if layers. But admittedly, that is mostly not feasible for most people. So do one of each and that will be considered a comprehensive two-step response as well. Once you have done that two-step process, the next step is being able to explain the value of what you just did. Tell the audience or the judge why what you just said is so important. This is known as proving significance or the so what phase of response. The point of this is that even if you successfully take down a single argument from the other side with the two-step process, the judge might still not see why all of this work was relevant or important to care about. They might ask, so what? Why does this matter? There are two ways in which you could prove the significance of your claims. The first is proving attack value. You can do this at the end of your rebuttal by saying, this takes down the other side's point of X by showing that blah, blah, blah. This helps the judge to match responses directly to the relevant points the other side is making. This is important to show that you are targeting the specific crucial elements of your opponent's case. The second way in which you could prove the significance of your claim is in showing defense value. You can do this at the end of your rebuttals by saying, this reinforces and further elaborates my teammate's point about ABC. This ensures that your team is showing consistency and continuity down the line. As a crucial part of identifying the attack or defense value of your rebuttal, don't forget to link directly to the words of the motion. This guarantees that you are staying relevant in the round. Think of this like the conclusion paragraph in your compositions or essays at school, where you bring everything back together nicely and make sure that everything stays relevant. So the final template for basic rebuttals now has three steps. Not true, even if, and then so on. So now that we know how to rebut in its basic terms, it's time to take it one step further. Let's talk about the different strategies available in choosing which arguments to rebut from the other side. There are about four possible strategies. They are known as the clarification, the trench warfare, the meta rebuttal, and the value add. Let's start with clarification. The clarification is especially useful when either your case has been misrepresented by the opponent or you are in an extremely messy debate and need to clear up what the real comparisons are. Clarifications usually should happen at the very start of your speech explain what the confusion is and clearly and succinctly describe what the real comparison should be in one short and sweet sentence. If you meander and use long sentences at this point, instead of clarifying, it will probably end up further confusing everyone. The second strategy is trench warfare. This basically refers to point-for-point point detailed back-and-forth engagement with the other team. Oftentimes, this is done in chronological order, where you do one of three things or probably all three of these things. The first is to revive points that were forgotten or ignored by the other side. 
point out the arguments that were ignored from your own teammates, but also point out things that your opponents might have said in the first speech, but that their second and third speakers chose to not defend. By pointing out these things, you are then identifying to the judges what continues to remain relevant and what doesn't. The second thing you could do under this is to attack all substantive points from the other side in chronological order. And the last thing is to defend all of your team's substantive points from the attacks by the other side. You often do this in a comprehensive and well-structured way to make it look like you are covering all your bases and attacking them from all sides. So trench warfare literally is the strategy of taking aim at every single thing in the case and not leaving anything out. The third strategy is meta rebuttal. This is when you are evaluating even as you rebut, doing the adjudicator's work for them by weighing up the issues of the debate. There are a few ways to accomplish this one as well. The first is to reframe the debate, give the judges a new perspective to look at the debate from or a new lens to look at the arguments from. This could look like showcasing a new context or a new country, um, a new type of example to want to look at your arguments by, or a new stakeholder being described as the most vulnerable actor in the debate and reframing the lens in which the debate needed to be judged by. The second type of meta rebutting is in drawing comparatives, to be able to take propositions characterization and oppositions characterization and compare them to each other and prove one side as being more likely or more feasible. You can also compare principles or compare specific outcomes between the two teams. The last way to accomplish meta rebutting is in a best case, worst case evaluation. This is where you take your team's worst case scenario and weigh it up against your opponent's best case scenario and prove why even then your case is still better than theirs. Note here that it is incredibly unstrategic to do the reverse version of this where you only compare your best case scenario to their worst case scenario. This is easily rebuttable and will be a waste of speech time. If you want to truly be a meta rebuttal in that argument, you must make sure you compare your worst to their best so that you prove that even in their best case scenario, they are not doing as well. The fourth and final strategy is the value add. Again, there are three different ways you could do this and they apply to different speakers at different points. The first is mostly for second speakers. It's known as fortifying the substantive. This is where the second speaker reinforces weak or vulnerable points in previous substantives that were already delivered. In this way, you will be defending against the attacks of your opponents and making sure that the case that happened in your first speaker continues to stand. The second way to value add is to add tiers of rebuttal. Tell the audience that your previous speaker has already posed whatever rebuttal to a point, then add on to it with new layers of attack. So for instance, saying something like, my second speaker already said X, Y, Z in response to this argument, but here are two more reasons why this argument fails. So what you're doing is recalling what your teammate has said so that judges remember that this rebuttal exists, but also then adding to it to make sure that the rebuttal is doubly strong. The third type of value add you could do is to ground or illustrate your existing ideas. Sometimes points and rebuttals can become far more convincing when you illustrate how they play out in the real world use analogies of how people might think about this situation or how governments or organizations or different stakeholders might react to such certain situations. And that kind of grounding or illustration tends to give more weight to a lot of the points and rebuttals that are being made. The reality is that you cannot really do all four of these strategies at once. And many a time, these strategies might end up clashing with one another. 
every debate is different and you will have to choose which one is more appropriate in that moment depending on what your opponents have done and how it compares to your side. Always think about what will be most effective in this moment. Should I rebut each separate idea in the trench warfare strategy? Maybe because all of the ideas are so disparate and different from one another? Or are all of their ideas somewhat similar and can be grouped and compared in meta rebuttal? Or maybe is it more important to fortify the walls of our own case and value at first because the other team maybe is spending more time attacking us than building their own case. Admittedly, the ability to know which one to do at which point in time takes some experience and practice to execute effectively within the short space of a competition. But this is why practice and training is so crucial and it's important to keeping up your skills and ensuring that you can debate. Now that we've understood some strategies on how to choose what to rebut, let's look at some basic fallacies that happen a lot when engaging in arguments. These happen in debating fairly often, but you probably encounter them far more in your day-to-day -day lives as well. With each of these fallacies, I've also attached either a comic or cartoon or chart of some sort so that you can get a better example or explanation of what these fallacies look like. We're going to be looking at seven different fallacies in this section. They are circular logic, slippery slopes, false dichotomies, correlations not equating to causations, red herrings and whataboutism, straw men, and ad hominem attacks. Don't worry about whether or not you will remember the names or the words for these. What is important is being able to understand the context in which these arguments happen and being able to call them out as being a logical problem so that you can question whether or not the analysis given by your opponents is right. It does not matter if you remember the names of the fallacies as it is remembering what exactly the fallacy is. So starting with the first fallacy, which is circular logic. Here's a cartoon that gives you an example of what circular logic sounds like. Circular logic basically refers to using a premise to form a conclusion and then using the conclusion to prove that the premise is true. Therefore, no actual analysis to develop the argument but A because B and B because A. Therefore, neither argument actually gets proven. The second fallacy is slippery slopes. Here is also another Dilbert comic to explain a slippery slope. Slippery slopes basically refer to an argument that claims that a relatively small first step leads to some sort of chain of related events that culminate in a super significant negative effect, but that doesn't prove step by step how any of this is so. One of the most common slippery slopes in debating are often about legalization. It is often argued that if you legalize A, then it will get normalized in society and a desensitized population will then be okay with also legalizing some extreme situations, sometimes like murder, rape, or anarchy. That is the ultimate slippery slope and, has ne and does not get proven as to why, it is, why those things are likely. The next fallacy is false dichotomy. Here's another quick comic to help with this definition. A false dichotomy basically refers to when the only two options presented to you are both wrong or when there should have been a third middle ground option or when the two options presented to you are mutually not exclusive or can happen at the same time.
The fourth fallacy is correlations not equating to causations. Here's a quick chart to give you a better idea of what this means. In this chart, it shows total revenue generated by game arcades correlates with computer science doctorates awarded in the US. If you go by this chart, it almost seems like the message being sent by it is that computer science doctorates increased in its awarding because game arcades generated an increased revenue. This is not the case and is a fallacy. Just because both of these things have the same trajectory on the chart or seem to correlate in its numbers does not mean that one caused the other or one had any effect on the other. So correlation does not equate to causation. The fifth fallacy is red herrings and water baptisms. Red herrings refer to something that might have some truth, but is being used to distract you from something more important or to make comparisons that are unnecessary. Sometimes they take the form of whataboutisms, which are just when someone says, well, you think X is bad, but what about Y? You then end up falling into the trap of then rebutting or dealing with these red herrings and the whatabouts instead of the more important comparisons of the debate. We see this in news media a lot nowadays, especially in polarizing ideological political views, where both sides of a political debate will look at the other side and go, you think X, but what about Y? What about Z? What about A? And what eventually happens is a devolving, spiraling downwards discussion that just constantly throws what about at one another, as opposed to making the real comparisons or the real moral questions that the actual debate started with. So do not emulate these kinds of political media discussions in your debating. Do not engage in what aboutisms within your debating that is very much a fallacy. The sixth fallacy to look at is a straw man. Again, another Dilbert comic to help. Dilbert comics seem to be incredibly useful for fallacy identification. A straw man is when you substitute a person's actual position or argument with a distorted, exaggerated, or misrepresented version of that position or argument and then end up rebutting that distorted version. This is both not effective as a rebuttal strategy because you don't target the main thing that the team was saying and something that you should absolutely call out when your opponents do to you. Always rebut the best version of the rebuttals of the best version of the arguments from your opponents. If you find the weakest link of their case and only rebut that, it is, yes, that is engagement, but it is not truly taking down the premises and the core themes of what the opponents were going for. Don't find the weakest element or straw man or distort what they want and rebut that. Find the core of what they actually want and respond to that as the best case version of their arguments. The last fallacy is the ad hominem attack. Ad hominem is basically a fancy term for name calling or personal attacks. Again, another Dilbert comic that will help with this. An ad hominem is when you choose to use the individual characteristics of the speaker against them in arguments or to attack the speaker instead of making responses against the arguments that they were making. At debate tournaments, ad hominems are not just a fallacy. They are also considered an equity violation. Equity refers to the fair and respectful treatment of all participants at the debate competition. There are strict rules of equity to follow and penalties for violating them. Depending on the seriousness of the violation, penalties could range from just requiring an apology 
to as much as being immediately disqualified from the tournament. So if you learn nothing but one thing from this lecture, please do not engage in ad hominem attacks, treat all participants with dignity and respect, and only ever choose to rebut the arguments that speakers make instead of attacking the speakers themselves. These seven fallacies are used very often in conversations and in arguments. The best form of engagement is not to just point out the existence of this fallacy, i.e. don't just say, hey, that's a slippery slope, but explain why the fact that it is a fallacy is a problem to the quality of the argument. For example, say something along the lines of opposition's argument on X being better than Y is a false dichotomy. It is untrue that these are the only two alternatives available. The third alternative that we defend is Z. This alternative is better than the other two in this false dichotomy because blah, blah, blah. In this way, you are not just calling out the fallacy, but doing something about the argument that was presented to you. I hope that was easy and something that you understood how to achieve. Because now that we've covered everything based on rebuttals, let's do a quick activity to try to craft a comprehensive rebuttal and see if you still remember the three-step template from the beginning of the lecture. So let's assume that team proposition has made an argument that says the government has a huge budget deficit or loss. To overcome this, we should cut spending and cut taxes. If you were in opposition, how would you rebut it? Let's take two minutes now collectively and think about what are the different steps we would take to make a comprehensive rebuttal to this. At the end of the two minutes, I will tell you what my answers are and you can see if your answers matched up with mine. So let's take two minutes now. All right, the two minutes are up. I hope you've done as much of the two step, three step process of rebuttal as you possibly could. So here are the steps to rebuttal I came up with to this argument. Let's see if yours matched up with mine. The first step to responding to this argument is to say, mm. not true. The government does not have a huge loss in the budget, GST and income tax was just increased last year. This is just a factual claim. Obviously, we assume that this is true before you make this response. The second layer of rebuttal is to say, 
even if the government does have a huge budget deficit or loss, cutting taxes makes loss worse because they now earn less money from the people. The third possible even if is to say, even if it does cut losses, cutting spending could hurt the average person on the ground and therefore is an undesirable consequence that the government should not have. The next even if layer possibly is to say, even if it didn't hurt the average person, side opposition solution is better. We instead should increase the taxes for the rich because they are not hurt that much by an increase in taxation, but the additional money does also solve the problems of the huge budget deficit or loss. The important thing then at the end is so what? The answer to the so what is to say this is important because it takes down the efficacy of side propositions policy. Their policy doesn't solve the problems that they themselves set up in this debate and therefore do not achieve what they need to in terms of their burdens for this debate. And if you do all five of these layers of rebuttal, it is a completely comprehensive response. But of course, if you only did the not true layer and one of the even if layers, followed by the so what layer, that is still a good solid rebuttal and that is perfectly fine. So I hope that little exercise helped you get a general idea of how a comprehensive rebuttal works in the short term. Now imagine that you have to do this same exercise multiplied by the number of substantives, the policy, the stance, the definitions, the characterization setup of every single speaker of your opponent team. And then you realize the mammoth task that engagement truly is in debating. Admittedly, it does sound a bit daunting, especially if you're new to debating what exactly it takes to do rebuttal speeches. That's why I know at the start of debating, many people shy away from like third speakers because that is all response. However, I think if you practice and gain the skills of response and rebuttal, it's not just incredibly valuable in terms of becoming an excellent debater within the sport, but it's also incredibly valuable outside of debating when you then have the ability to have quick reflexes and quick response capacity when you engage in conversation and discourse in the real world. So definitely do try and practice creating rebuttals and practice your response reflex skills in order to be able to have quick wit and quick responses to things that come up in conversation as well as in debate arguments. I would suggest that the best way to do this is to actually watch a bunch of debate videos on YouTube. There are hundreds upon hundreds of possibilities. Find good quality videos. Listen to, say, the first speaker, track that first speaker's speech, craft rebuttals to it, and then check whether or not you are doing all three layers of rebuttal to every single thing. And if you do enough of those self practices of your own of creating such rebuttals and choosing what to rebut and how to rebut from those instances, then you develop a sort of second nature ability to do this far more quicker um, as an individual and then can put those skills together with a team when you enter a competition as a debate team. All right, the next part of this lecture is going to focus on points of information. Even though POIs make up less time of each speech than rebuttals do, they are just as important to a team's engagement strategy. Admittedly, this next part of the lecture is exclusively relevant to competitive debating because you are not going to go POIs anywhere else except in debating. You're not going to do that in real life. But that is okay. This is the debate association lecture. You're here for competitive debating. We're going to focus on a few different things, including when to ask POIs, how to ask, and what to do when POIs are accepted. So let's start with the absolute basics of what a POI is. A POI is fundamentally 
an interruption of your opponent's speech. This can be asked during what is known as unprotected time. Unprotected time is between the first and last minute of the speech. What basically happens then is when a speaker starts their speech, a timekeeper starts a timer. At the one minute mark, either a bell or a clap is usually heard. And then let's say it's a six minute speech, then at the five minute mark, another clap will be heard. And anything between the two single claps is considered unprotected time. But anything before the first minute clap and after the five minute clap is known as protected time. During protected time, you cannot ask any POIs. You can only ask them in unprotected time. To ask a POI, you must stand up. Well, in in-person tournaments, you must stand up. You don't have to stand up if it's an online tournament. And when you stand up, ask to be accepted by the speaker. Do not preempt your question at this point. Merely say point or POI or point of information or on that point, and then wait to be accepted or rejected by the speaker. So the speaker themselves can say, yes or no, depending on whether they want to take that POI in that moment. If they say yes, then that is you having been accepted. If they say no, that is a rejection of that POI and you have to sit down. You can ask a POI every 20 seconds. This 20 second gap has two particular rules. One, that it applies to the whole team. So if you ask the POI and got rejected, your whole team has to wait 20 seconds before someone can stand up to ask again. Not waiting this 20 seconds is known as heckling or barracking, and it is considered an unfair interruption of the speaker. The second thing to note about this 20 second gap is that it applies to the end of the answering of the previous POI. So for instance, if I asked the POI and got accepted, I asked my question. If the speaker is answering the POI, I cannot stand up while I'm listening to the answer of my last POI for the next POI. The 20 second rule applies to from the moment the answer to my last POI has ended. Once accepted, you are given up to 15 seconds to ask your question. Make sure that it is always phrased as a question. If you just stand up and say, what you just said is untrue, and then sit down, that is not a valuable use of the POI. Make sure that the question that you ask is something that is strategic, that will confront the speaker. We'll talk about this a bit more in just a bit. Every speaker must take at least one POI from your opponents during your speech. But it is highly recommended that you do not take any more than two. If you start taking a third and a fourth and a fifth POI, that is you basically telling the judge that you really didn't have content of your own prepared for this speech and therefore are relying on your opponents to give you new or more material to speak on. Do not send that impression. Do not take more than two POIs, but you must take at least one. So that's the basics of a POI. The next important question to ask is, when is the most strategic to ask a POI? There are three possible options. The first is to offer early, as soon as the one minute bell or clap rings. In this way, you show enthusiasm to engage and get to challenge some of the early premises made in your opponent's case or speech. The second possibility is to offer POIs during a strong argument being made. This gives off the impression that you are taking on the challenge from the opponent head on and are taking out the most vital part of their case. Or the third option, is to offer POIs in response to small, unimportant issues in order to save speech time from being used to rebut these minor issues. Personally, I think this last strategy 
is the weakest of the three because it does the least amount of damage to your opponent's case. I would suggest looking into or prioritizing questioning the strongest argument in the speech as much as possible because that is what a real engagement challenge looks like. So now that we know when to ask, how do you ask though? Firstly, make sure you keep them short and sweet. I know the limit is 15 seconds to ask a question and that does allow you to have a fairly long question in that time. However, if you can ask a poignant and, and crucial question in far less time than that, that is when you are the most effective. If you ramble on in the POI, it is hard to keep track of the question you are trying to ask and it becomes, becomes incredibly easy to dodge having to answer it. Make sure that it is phrased carefully and in a targeted way to derive an answer from them that will benefit your team. So don't just point out things that are untrue or ask for clarification on things. Make sure you plan it out as a team, choose the words and the phrasing carefully, and plan what question to ask based on a specific answer you're expecting or that you want the speaker to conceive to. Lastly, and most importantly, be loud and confident in the delivery of the POI. Don't show signs of uncertainty and weakness, but instead show off your clarity and determination to take down the point. No matter how bad you think your question is, if delivered with the right amount of confidence, it will have some value to the overall debate. Next, let's talk about when you take a POI. So if you were the speaker on the floor and your opponents were asking you a POI, when is more strategic for you to take one? Many debaters tend to wait till like 20 seconds before the end of unprotected time to take a POI. This is in fact fairly unstrategic because you have basically laid out almost your entire case for the opponents and have opened yourself up to being attacked on any of those things in your entire speech. It is in fact far more strategic to take a POI early, preferably within the first two and a half minutes where you can make clarifications and then integrate the response to the POI with everything else you're going to say in the rest of your speech. Most importantly, however, do not interrupt yourselves to take a POI. Finish the thought you were in the middle of explaining and then accept it. You can even plan to say you will only take a POI when you transition between argument one and argument two, or when you're moving from rebuttals to arguments. It is perfectly okay to make an opponent wait for like 20 to 30 seconds before taking their POI. This is important because if you disrupt your train of thought in order to answer a POI, you are definitely never going to find your way back to where you were, which would leave the argument incomplete in its analysis. This is bad for yourselves. Do not stop talking in order to turn and respond to your opponent who is standing up. It's okay to leave them standing. Just acknowledge that you know that they are standing. Finish what you are saying. Finish the argument or the thought or the sentence or the main claim and then turn to your opponent and go, yes. At which point you would have finished the argument and then can still respond to the idea that is being brought up in the POI comprehensively. Once you have taken, remember to respond to the judges and not to the opponents. This is true even in rebuttal or in substantive making. Do not turn to face your opponents and then talk to them in response. They are never going to agree with you anyway. That is why they are your opponents. The person you are trying to convince of your answers are the judges. So even though the opponents phrase the question that sounded like they wanted a specific answer, don't turn to them and answer. Turn to the judge and make sure you're talking directly to the judge when you make the answers to that question. Make sure you have a clear and succinct response immediately. Don't push it too later in your speech, but also don't get sucked into an elaborate and long-winded response. 
if the answer to the POI is something that you already planned to cover later, you can say that you will explain in more detail later, but do still give a brief version of what the answer is immediately first, and then you can elaborate much later in the speech. So do not just, as a response to the POI, immediately say, oh, I'll deal with this later, because it immediately gives an impression to the judge that maybe you don't actually know the answer to the question and you're trying to divert attention. So to avoid that impression, give some sort of answer first and then you can elaborate it later. Ideally, you should not take longer than 20 to 25 seconds to answer the POI. If at the end of one minute after the POI, you are still explaining something about it, that is when you have been caught by a red herring or what about, and you have lost track of the plot point of what your speech is. So make sure your answers are short, succinct, and clear so that the judge understands what your real answer to the question is. All right. We have now fully covered all of the strategies on how you should approach engagement in debating, both in rebuttals and in POIs. The next question that some of you may have is, how do I achieve all of this in the middle of the debate? It's already so stressful. There's so many things happening. I have two other teammates to care about. Is it even feasible to ever achieve all of these things? Of course, a lot of it does just come from experience and practice in order to get the speed and reflex for these mechanisms. However, a large part of it is an effective note-taking. What I'm about to share with you are the note-taking strategies that have worked for me personally and for some of my students. Admittedly, effective note-taking is all about what you work most comfortably with. So use any training opportunities that you have to explore various methods of note-taking and see what works best for you. However, this next method is what I have found to be the most effective for me and for the most number of people around me. So let's start with the basic tracking sheet. There are two ways to think about this. You can either consider this a team tracking sheet where one person tracks the entire debate for the entire team and all three speakers who work off this one sheet or all three speakers in a team could potentially have their own tracking sheet to achieve this as well. I think the consequential impact is probably the same. The only minor difference might be that if there is one tracking sheet for the whole team, there is a bit more consistency down the line. However, I understand sometimes that's not completely feasible. Each speaker might want to have their own note taking and their own tracking sheet for the whole debate. So this is how I would do a basic tracking sheet. I start with folding the paper into half. The left side is for whatever our opponents are saying. In this column, just track the headings of what they are saying first. So rebuttal one, rebuttal two, policy, substantive one heading, substantive two heading, etc. Any important details as the speech goes along, can be summarized in one or two bullet points under each of these sections. The right column then is for what our response is going to be. So you can jot down rough ideas for what you might want to say for each layer of rebuttal first. So usually I would immediately write N, T, E, I, and S, W, which stands for not true, even if, and so what at each point and have some summarized, shorthanded version of what I want to say for each of those layers. For the layers that I definitely know the response to. You can then quietly confer with a teammate if you need help with crafting the answers to any of the other layers that you maybe can't think of at the top of your head or need help in phrasing particularly. Prior to going up to speak, it is important to number and prioritize each of these rebuttals. Sometimes, a lot of these arguments might overlap with one another. For instance, maybe rebuttal one and substantive two are somewhat similar in line. 
what is important then is to use colored pens or draw arrows to connect it so that when you go up to speak, you won't end up sounding repetitive when you make the rebuttal once um, in the early part and then the rebuttal again in the latter part of your speech instead to combine the two arguments and make one solid rebuttal. So make sure to number, prioritize, draw arrows and connections through this sheet in order to organize your rebuttal and tracking sheet before you head up for your speech. Make sure that the arguments that are the most important on the other side are the ones that you do the rebuttals for first. Because those are the ones that are the most important to take down and therefore will need the most amount of your attention. If you spend a lot of your time rebutting something that is not as important to their case, you might end up running out of time at the end of your speech in making the actual important rebuttals for the crucial parts of the debate. So always do the most important things first and make sure you spend the most amount of your speech time dealing with those and then reprioritize accordingly so that the least important stuff are the things that you take down at the end. That just requires you to use a lot of arrows, numbering, different colored pens on the stretch sheet to achieve that. Now, if you can nail this basic tracking sheet, you can move on to adding a second sheet for tracking. For the second sheet, I suggest or recommend that this is a team sheet, i.e. everyone on the team has one sheet of paper that this gets done on. In this advanced sheet, we track burdens of proof. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this term, either because you've never heard it before or didn't attend any of the previous lectures, while you are prepping as a team, you should be trying to identify what are the key questions your team has to answer in order to win. These are regularly referred to as your burdens to prove. Both sides of a debate always have equal and opposite burdens to prove. For example, if proposition has to prove why a policy will be successful, then opposition has the burden to prove why that policy will be unsuccessful as well. I hope everyone understands how burdens of proof function. Now, in this advanced track sheet, you should be able to identify and write down a list of all of your burdens of proof in the debate and therefore also what your opponent's burdens are. So on a sheet of paper, write down our burdens are one, two, three. Their burdens, therefore, are minus one, minus two, minus three on the opposite side. As the debate goes along, you then fill in the document by saying, we have fulfilled this burden at this point in time. For instance, second speaker's substantive fulfills burden two. And then third speaker defended this substantive in rebuttal when they talked about X, Y, Z. In the same way, burden one was not fulfilled by all three speakers on the other side because of whatever reason. And second speaker on our side attacked this argument as well. So fill in as the debate goes along what you have achieved in the debate what you have defended on your side and what you have attacked on theirs. This will help you to decide how to prioritize and choose which arguments to rebut first as well. Because arguments that help prove a burden are more relevant and important than one that doesn't prove any specific burden. Therefore, those are the ones that you need to attack more in your opponent's case and it's also the one you must defend most closely in your own case. Filling up this second track sheet as the debate goes along is also particularly useful for the third speaker and reply speaker to craft their clashes. They will get a good big picture of what the debate is like and what the real comparisons should be and be able to explain to the judge what went well in their own case and what went poorly in the opponent's case. Admittedly, this second track sheet is something that you have to practice using with your team 
and having clear communication across the board with your teammates as to who is filling in which part of the form and when this template is passed from speaker to speaker or else it will not be as effective as it could be. Hopefully, however, both of these tracking sheet templates get used to help you develop more clarity about the debate that you are in and how to engage more meaningfully because you can now prioritize the arguments that you choose to rebut, how they are rebutted, and be able to keep track of what has been responded to already and what has not been responded to yet. Because the important thing about debating as an activity in general is that it is a team sport. You have to work as a team and be able to work with one another and fill up each other's weaknesses so that you have a comprehensive case as a team and be able to win. So that brings us to the end of this lecture. I hope you have learned some new skills on how to engage an argument both in and out of debating. Feel free to ask me any questions about any of this material or any other thing with regards to engagement and debating about now. Thank you.